Amen. What a privilege it is to be here with you today at Discovery Church. Karen and I are so blessed to be a part of this fellowship with you today. I just want to say thank you to Pastor Tim for the invitation to be here. Uh, you have one of the most amazing pastors and leaders that we have across Florida and beyond. Uh, we love Tim Carroll. I know you rejoice in what God does through his life as well. So thank you, Tim, so much for this privilege of being here. I ask you today to open the Word of God to the book of Jude. Jude is a one-chapter book toward the end of the New Testament, right before the book of Revelation. Uh, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 3 as we continue uh, the series of I Declare War. And uh, I would encourage you, if you're able, to stand in honor of God's precious word, Jude, uh, the, the cha single chapter, verses 1 through 3. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And then in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessings upon your word. May it accomplish what you desire for it to accomplish in our lives today. May we hear what the Spirit is saying. And we ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. The challenge of this scripture is found in verse 3, to contend passionately, fervently, earnestly for the faith. This challenge is one for our generation, and we are called in this generation to stand up and to speak up for the faith. We're not the first, nor will be the last, who are called to contend. As a matter of fact, they contended in the first generation church, and we stand on the shoulders of brothers and sisters in Christ who for generations have contended and engaged the culture around them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need to be very clear today that we are in a battle we can say, I declare war, but yet the battle is raging all around us. We're in a battle for the faith. We're in a battle for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in a battle for the eternal souls of men and women and boys and girls. The church, the people of God, we are under attack, and we cannot retreat. We cannot back out. We cannot tap out. We cannot give up. We might, cannot be silent. We must contend. And every person is engaged individually within this warfare and within this battle. On a Sunday, I was preaching at a church a few weeks ago, and uh, they had two services. In the second service, there was a young lady who came into the service, and she sat at the end of a row. And so when I was preaching, she was just almost like directly in front of me, and she was just very intent. Her, you know, just very engaged in everything that was being said. You could tell that the Holy Spirit was contending with her. There was something in her life. I, I don't know what that was at that moment, but you could tell that she was grappling and struggling and that God was convicting her and calling her and challenging her within her heart through his precious word. The invitation and opportunity to respond was given, and she, she stood there, and you could tell that she was just wrestling inside internally with many different things, and she did not respond in any way publicly. Publicly at that moment. The service, it was over. We were standing at the front, and, and she started making her way. She didn't leave. She stayed in the, in the, in the, in the room, and she came walking toward me, and, and, I, and I walked to where she was, introduced myself, and she introduced herself. She's a young lady in her early 20s. She's a collegiate student in one of our universities here in Florida, and she was home for the weekend visiting with her mother. She began sharing with me about her life, and she said that, that my life is in an absolute mess I'm in relationships that are, that are abusive. I, I, I just have one thing after another. It always just seems to be destructive and ends in, in, in wrong things happening in my life, and I'm just guilty. I, I, I'm, I'm shameful. I'm, I'm tired. I'm weary. I just have something needs to happen. Something needs to be different within my life. She said that this morning I woke up, and I, I decided I, I was going to go to church. She said when my, my parents were together and we were smaller children, we used to go to church on Sunday 
Sundays, and they had divorced. And she said, from that time on, our family just never really got back in, in church or really cared about the things of the Lord. But she said, I just knew that there was something there that probably I needed to hear today. She said, so I got in my car, and I started driving, and I stopped at a church, and I went in, started sitting in the service, and she said, something inside of me just said, get up and leave. She said, so I, I left that church. She said, I don't, I don't know what was going on. And she said, so I got in my car, and I started driving again. I came to, and I saw this church. And she said, I just pulled in the parking lot, and I came in. And she said, as soon as I sat down, the music and, and just what was happening in here just, just grabbed hold of me. And she said, the things that you spoke of today were things I know that I need within my life. And so we began talking about what it meant to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, on that day, she was declaring war, that no longer do I want my life to be in bondage. No longer do I want my life to be at this place of pain and shame and hurt and guilt and condemnation. I need something in my life. And on that day, she repented of her sins and confessed Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And her life was eternally changed to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church was able to connect with her. She was baptized. We got her connected with the, the collegiate ministry on the campus where she is currently in school. You see, warfare is real. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And you know that within your life. You've experienced that firsthand within your life. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. In Ephesians 6, we're encouraged to put on the whole armor of God that we will be able to stand. In James chapter 4, the Bible says to submit to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In 1 John 4, 4, we are reminded that we are of God, little children. We've overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so the battle that we face every day is real, and we must trust in the power and in the presence of the Lord. I don't have to tell you this, but you know this, that, that evil is real. Evil has a place. Evil has a face, and evil has a taste. It, ha it has a place. Many of you were drawn even this past week to a place that you know does not honor the Lord, a place that you know you do not need to be. And evil has that attraction, the deception of the evil one draws you to that place. It has a, it has a face. You're drawn towards something or someone that, 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 that attracts you, and, and you find yourself at a, at, at a face where you know you shouldn't be. And evil has a taste. The addictions of this world have touched totally engulf the lies of individuals. And so this morning, I want us to, to, to recognize that the battle is real, and we need to be anchored in God's Word if you and I, if we together are going to be able to contend earnestly and contend victoriously for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. And so within the Scripture that we've read today, we find that Jude lays out a very clear pathway for me and for you, what it means to be able to stand strong, what it means to be able to, to, to rise up, what it means to be able to overcome. Jude clearly delineates that within this word today. And so in order for us to see that, I want us to walk through these three areas that Jude gives to us. The first one is, I must decrease. Now, that sounds counterintuitive. When we talk about fighting and preparing, when we talk about being engaged and contending, the first thing we think of is that I've just got to get stronger. I've got to get bigger. I've got to get better. I, I, I've got to do more on my own. But yet Jude reminds us that we cannot fight this battle on our own. We cannot fight this battle in the flesh. We cannot fight this battle with our own wisdom, with our own strength, and with our own resources. He says, I must decrease. Would we say that together out loud? I must decrease. Now, he helps us see that in the way that he introduces himself within this epistle. He says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now, that introduction says, I decrease. He's a bondservant. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. You see, he is saying, I have submitted my life to Christ. 
I have surrendered who I am to the authority and to the lordship of Jesus Christ. I am a servant of Christ. That very statement says Christ is elevated. Christ supersedes. Christ is above. And I submit and I yield. I am totally committed to who he is within my life. You see, the focus of Jude's life shifted when he became a believer. It's no longer about me, he's saying. It's about Christ, and I am a servant of Jesus Christ. But he also says that I'm a brother of James. Now, who is this individual, James? James was a servant of the Lord. He was a leader in contending for the faith in Jerusalem during biblical times. From A.D. 44 to his death by martyrdom in A.D. 61, he wrote the epistle of James in the New Testament, and he identifies James as his brother. So now we have a family connection here, servant of Jesus, brother of James. So Jude and James are brothers. So who is this family what is this connection that we have? If we look in Matthew chapter 13, we're able to see there where Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth. And you remember the statement that he made, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. There were people there who looked upon him with such familiarity that they did not believe he was God's son. They could not see him as the Messiah. And so as they were questioning this, they said, is not this the carpenter's son, referring to Jesus. Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Jude? You see, James and Jude are the earthly brothers of Jesus. Now, think about that. I'm a servant of Jesus, but I'm a brother of James. I must decrease. From identity as a brother to identify as a servant. Jude fully embraced the divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. Jude totally trusted the incarnation of Jesus. Jude completely acknowledged the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Jude absolutely accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now, be real about it. I mean, my temptation, probably your temptation maybe, would have been to have leveraged that relationship to increase our network or to increase our popularity. I mean, you know, I'm just hanging out, talking with a group of people. Well, you know, I am the brother of Jesus. No, that's not how he said it. He said, I am the servant of Jesus, and I'm the brother of James. He did not tout that he was a brother of Christ. He did not demand or claim any level of entitlement. He did not pursue star status. He didn't pursue power, prominence, prestige, or position because of family connections. He humbly declared, I am a servant of of Jesus Christ. I must decrease. And the same is true for me and you. If I'm going to be a follower of Christ, I must decrease to his glory. I must surrender my life to his leadership and to his lordship. So we move forward. Not only must I must decrease, but he must increase. Let's say that together. He must increase. My decreasing allows him to increase. When I submit my life, I'm more in a position to receive his word, his will, his authority over me. As long as I am at the head, then he cannot be at the head. But when he is at the head, then I am able to, to yield my life gladly, joyfully. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not a chore. It's not a battle. It's not something that, that, that a hardship. Man, I willingly, gladly you know, yield my life unto Jesus Christ. And so he says he must increase. Now, he says it in such a way that he reminds us of why he must increase. He says it in two different triplets. He says because we are called, we're sanctified, and we are preserved. And then he says, mercy, love, and peace. All that's part of Christ increasing within our life. Think about called. He calls us unto himself. He first loved us. He loved us when we were unlovable. He reached out to us when we were unreachable. He died for us in that while we were still yet in our sin, he would give himself fully and totally for our lives. 
You see, he called us. He knows our name. He knows our need. He doesn't forget us. He doesn't forsake us. He doesn't turn his back away from us. He cares for me, and he cares for you. And so he calls us. He sanctifies us sanctifies us. In that abandonment of our life unto him, he sanctifies our life. We love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and body and strength. And as a result of that, we increase in our life in faith and holiness and purity and in righteousness. We are set apart and we are set for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're preserved. He, he keeps watch over us in this battle, in this warfare, in contending for the faith and living our life for him. He never lets go of us. He keeps watch over our lives every day. He guards you. He holds you fast. Your salvation is sealed and secured eternally in Jesus Christ the Lord. And then he adds the amazing blessings and the benefits of that salvation. I mean, it should be just enough that we're called and sanctified and preserved, but yet he multiplies. It's like standing in front of a waterfall, and it just keeps flowing more and more and powerfully upon our life. His mercy that is renewed every day within our life. His peace, the peace that passes all understanding. His love in that he gave his one and only son because he loved us that we might know him and have a personal relationship through him. And so here we see what takes place in our life when we decrease, when I decrease and he increases. Oh, he must increase. He was at a place of equality with God the Father in heaven. God God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, co-eternal, co -eternal, co equal and co-existent. But in the fullness of time, he left heaven and came to earth there, conceived in the womb of a virgin by the name of Mary, a supernatural, miraculous, divine birth, conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. He was born into this world fully God, fully man, 100% God, 100% man. He's the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, as we read in the book of Revelation. And he lived a sinless, innocent, perfect life. And there upon the cross, the one who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God through him. He was the just one for the unjust. And there upon the cross, Jesus paid in full the price and the penalty for my sins and for your sins. He took them all upon himself. And through his precious shed blood, we can be redeemed through his blood to the Father through Jesus Christ the Lord. They placed his dead body in a grave, but on the third day, Jesus Christ burst forth from the grave, and because he lives, you and I have life abundant, and we have life everlasting. Oh, he must increase within our life. So I must decrease. He must increase. And then we come to verse 3. Because he says, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. Now, that phrase doesn't mean that salvation is common. It doesn't mean it's just ordinary. No, what he is saying is that every person who's saved is saved the same way. We're saved through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. But he is reminding that in our salvation, there are some things that I need to remind you of, exhort you in, encourage you in, kind of kick us in the pants in a little bit, to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And so he reminds us that as we decrease, as he increases, we, the church, we must release. We must release our lives into a world and contend for the faith. So let's say this together. We must release. We release. So here we are in this moment. We're in the fight, and we need Christ only. We need Christ alone. And Christ is sufficient in every battle. Yet Christ is called his church, and we need each other. Remember in Matthew 16 when he established the church, he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I mean, from day one, he said, you're going to be contending. <laughs> you're going to be in a battle. You're going to be in a fight. But know that I am the foundation. I am the solid rock. I'm the anchor upon which everything of your life and everything of the church is built. 
And so as you face the battle, you're not facing it alone. You have the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have each other within this battle. So together, we must release earnestly for the battle. That's what he's saying. I exhort you. I remind you. I want to encourage you because if you're not in it, you're heading toward it. And if you're in it, praise God, you may be headed out of it. But get ready. The moment that you say that Jesus Christ is Lord, you have placed your life in a position that is diametrically opposed to everything that is found in our world. And if you're going to name the name of Jesus, you are going to be engaged in spiritual warfare. And so the word that he uses for contend in this verse is a very interesting word. In the center of that verse, in the, in the construction, in the original Greek language, is the word hagon, which is the word for stadium. And so he's saying you're going to contend and he gives the arena of being in a, in a stadium in, in a battle, a stadium contending, fighting. And that's what the word means, to struggle, to fight. You know, it's not something you do comfortably. It's not something you do easily. It's going to require something out of you and out of me. And I can't do it if it's about me, but I can do it when Christ in me, the hope of glory, enables me to live victoriously day by day. But think about that image of contending in the stadium. You see, many in the church go into the stadium. They want to sit up in the stands. It's easy to sit up there and complain and gripe and grumble and, well, they ought to do it this way and they ought to do it that way. Well, if I were down there, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, you know, and, and here you are up there just telling others what they ought to be doing, but you're not contending. You, you've become a hindrance because you're not engaging your life. But what I have found is this. When you're down there on the floor of that stadium and you're in the battle, you're not, you're not griping, you're not grumbling, you're not complaining, you're not, you're not looking at other people and saying what they ought to be doing and not doing. You're just thankful someone is down there in the fight with you and you you know you need everyone and everybody that you can bring together to stand strong in the Lord. And that's the image that we have in this text. We are the church. We're on the field. We're in the battle. We're in the stadium, and we're engaging in this warfare, and it will take all of us contending together, floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee if we're going to be victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need those who will be contenders and not pretenders within in the faith, contenders and not pretenders because we're in a cultural war. We're in this worldview battle. We're in the societal struggle, racism and social injustice and sanctity of life issues, physical abuse, emotional abuse, spousal abuse, child abuse, financial abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, broken family lives all around us, a post-Christian culture, communities that are marked with crime and poverty and, and torn apart with fear, a world stage that has terrorism and uncertainty all around us, intolerance and immorality and homelessness and, 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 and ungodly agendas, moral relativism, prejudice, cynicism, violence violence, human sex trafficking, bigotry, addictions, lying, bondage, cheating, stealing, anger, hatred, greed, pornography, bitterness, envy, secret sins, public sins, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Around us are the weak and the wounded, the beaten and the berated, the forsaken and the forgotten, the isolated and the abandoned. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Those are the daily realities of the broken world in which we live. But all I wanted to do was just come to church. No, we're called to something much higher and much greater than that. We must contend. We must contend for our city. We must contend for our church. We must contend for our family. We must contend for our marriage. We must contend for our children. We must contend for the truth. We must contend for the faith. We must contend for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we're called at the church. We must release in order to make an impact, in order to make an impact where we are. I was pastor at First Baptist Brandon, Florida, the Tampa area, for about 20 years. And I don't know how many times on Sunday I, I look at our folks and I say, do you think there's anybody in this community that really cares we're meeting today? I mean, think about that. You know, y'all go and do your own little church thing. It doesn't matter. <laughs> y'all just over there trying to make each other feel better, and you're not really doing. I mean, is that what the church is to be about? We're to be light. We're to be salt. We're to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's what the word teaches us. We're to be on mission, mobilized, doing the work of the kingdom for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't have to go looking for a fight. It's going to come to us. We don't have to go seeking out a battle. Just when we stand for Jesus, it's going to find us. 
And when it finds us, we have to be willing to stand and to stand strong and to stand firm. We had three services on Sunday morning at the church in Brandon, and, and uh, in between a couple of those services, I had a, had a deacon that came running up to me. I mean, he was just almost out of breath, and, and he looks at me, and he says, uh, he says Pastor, you got to come with me and come right now. Well, I mean, first of all, I was just excited to see that a deacon could, could sprint. You know, it was kind of neat seeing him run. And, and, then, and then and I thought, well, there must have been some medical emergency. They just want me to come, you know, and pray with the family and try to help. Or it could be that a toilet's overflowing, and they think I've got the ability to fix it. I mean, I, you know, I don't know why he was there. He said, you know, he said come with me. you got to come. And so I went walking with him. We walked outside the buildings, and, and I know my eyes just probably got as big as saucers in my mouth. Just, you know, jaw just had to drop open because I was not prepared for what I was seeing. Because on the sidewalks surrounding our church, we had about 20 acres there, and they had sidewalks in between roads. And, and around the, where the, the, the main auditorium sanctuary where we gathered on Sunday was, there were people, and they were standing all around holding signs and protesting the church. You see, within our community, there was an individual who, who kind of was a kingpin of adult entertainment across central Florida, and he was trying to open up an adult entertainment, a stripper club out, out in, our, in our community. And we, along with other churches, had taken a stand against it. And for whatever reason, we just kind of became the tip of the spear in terms of the backlash that, that was there. And so on that Sunday, they just showed up. And, I mean, then these signs, hey, you know, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I, I never seen anything like it in my life. I mean, you know, they don't, they don't teach you that in, in, in seminary, I promise you, you know. And so, so what, what do you do in that moment? How, how do you respond? And we realized our battle was not against those people. I mean, Jesus loved them as much as he loved us. He died for them as much as he died for us. He cares for them as much as he cares for us. So we knew that our, our opportunity was just to be a witness for Christ and to love on them. Even though we didn't agree with their position, they didn't agree with our position, but we had to contend earnestly. But we could not do it just in the battle of words. We had to do it in demonstrating the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so people just started ministering to them. I mean, they'd take them water. As, you know, classes would have food on Sunday. They'd take it out there and, you know, and give it to them. And, and you know, dear sweet ladies that had to park in parking lots and walk past them. They'd hug and, you know, some of those strippers standing there and, and they were clothed appropriately for their job and, and, and they would say, uh, oh, we hope you come back next Sunday. And I'm kind of like, well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, want them to come back, but maybe not for that reason, you know. And, and so it, this just went on for a period of time and, and, and we, we continued, you know, along with other churches taking this, this position of trying to keep this, this business from opening. Well, what I would say to you is we lost the battle we did not lose the war because the business did open. And where it opened was on Highway 60. If you've ever been to Brandon, I mean, that's like a major thoroughfare. It's one of the busiest roads in, in, in all of Florida, actually. And, uh, and, and here's an intersection where this club is found. There's a Home Depot. There's a Chick-fil-A. There's a Lowe's and a 7-Eleven. I mean, that's kind of the world that all of this was in at this main intersection with a red light. And so I started having parents come to me on Sunday, and they were saying, you know, we pull up to that light. And obviously, you know, we're headed to, to some of these businesses to, to, with our kids, and they look over and they see the signage on this building. They realize it's quite different than the other kind of signage, and they're asking, you know, what's going on in, in this place? And, and, and they said, you know, we've just been very honest with our children. We tell them it's a place where women are demeaned and devalued. It's a place where women are taken advantage of. It, it, they talked about human sex trafficking and what, what, what the, what's involved in that industry. And, and, and so from the back seats of these vehicles, children began praying. They began praying for the ladies that worked in these clubs. And I want to tell you, within six months after that business opened, God shut it down. And, and it wasn't because of what the church did necessarily. It was because children knew how to contend for the faith. And they believed in what God could do. And, and, and God worked in a powerful way. You see, I, I don't know what, what's ahead for you. But I've got to believe that if you're going through a series at a church, the pastor had on his heart of I declare war, that there's probably something out there. <laughs> there's something that, 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 that you're being prepared for to face. And, and in those moments, whether it be in your individual life or in the life of the church, this community, whatever that might be, you know, I'm thankful that we can look to God's word and see a very clear pathway of how we can make a difference and how we can contend in a biblical way. I must decrease. He must increase, and we, as the people of God, must be together as one and release our lives to what God would have us to do together to his honor and to his glory. This morning, in this invitation and response time, 
Uh, it may be that, you know, you're here and you know, there's just things in your life. You, you, you may be at the place that that young lady was that we spoke of earlier. You know, it just seems like everything around you is, 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 is causing hurt and pain. And you're, you're embarrassed. You may be ashamed. You may be looking and saying, you know, I just, I just, can't, I just can't keep doing this. I can't keep staying in, in these abusive situations and following the same path in my life. Is there any hope for me? Can, can, can things be better? Can things be different? Well, they can't be just because we say I want them to be. They are because we come and humble ourselves before the Lord and we decrease. And we cry out unto him and he increases. Oh, he loves you today. He cares about you. He desires today to forgive you, to cleanse you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin, cleanse of all unrighteousness. He'll do a great, miraculous, mighty work in your life today. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And so today, if that's a commitment decision that you need to make, I encourage you to come. Quit battling. Quit battling against yourself. Quit battling, but, but instead just, just release it all unto the Lord. Surrender yourself to him. If you do, he will lift you up today. He will forgive you, cleanse you. He will change your life eternally by his power, by his presence through his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. I ask you to come. There are others here today that may be in your family, in your, in your life, in your children, your marriage. There's just a battle going on. And, and, and you know, you, you may have dug in your heels, you gritted your teeth, you, you grabbed a hold and said, I'm, you know, and you're just tired. <laughs> you're realizing, I, I, can't, I can't do this on my own. I can't, I can't win this battle. I, 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 I don't have what it takes. And today the Lord is saying, come, just give it all to me. Come, just cry out to him. Pray that God would do a great work in the life of your husband, the life of your wife, in your life, in the life of your children. Maybe there's that prodigal today that, that, that just, you know, you know they're far away and you're contending and you're trying. Just give it to the Lord today. Give it to him today. Maybe today as a church, you just want to come and say, we, we want to contend earnestly. We want to be the kind of church, this community that people see Jesus Christ, our faithfulness in him and our love through him. And maybe you just want to come pray with a pastor, pray for your pastors who, are, who will be leading in these battles and, and, and just say, we're with you and we're together. Maybe you just want to pray together and somebody comes and somebody else wants to come pray with them and pray with them, whatever that might be, you know, I encourage you to come. So let's just stand with every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we ask now for these next moments, Lord, we just give them to you. Lord, this is by no means about anything of who we are, but Lord, this is all about what you desire within our lives. And Lord, there are some here today who do not know you as Lord and Savior, and I pray they'll come giving their life to you. There are some here today who are believers, but yet they're far away from you, Lord, and they're contending. And I pray, Lord, that they'll come and contend earnestly in you, that they'll just, Lord, surrender it all to you today. Father, whatever those decisions are as a church, may we just come forward today praying over and around our pastor, saying, Pastor, we stand with you and for you. We stand together in the gospel. We want to be strong as a, as a church, as a family. We release our lives together. So, Lord, we just ask that you'll move mighty and powerfully, and we pray this in Jesus' name.